This is a brief tutorial to give you an example of how to conduct both a formal and an iconographical analysis. Now this isn't the sexiest video you'll ever watch. I don't have any fancy bells or whistles here, but this video will give you a sense on how to interpret a work of art and it also introduces you to a wonderful painting made by my favorite ancient group, the Aegeans. Now, the most important part of a formal analysis is to keep in mind the three steps, identify, describe, and interpret. And you're gonna to wanna to move through these three steps in order, number one, the number two, the number three. And you wanna make sure that you address all three steps, otherwise your analysis will be incomplete. And I'm sure you do not want that. Now, let's take this opportunity to go through each of these steps. So first, we have identify, okay? And that's all you're doing is identifying. All you're doing is taking stock of what might be a significant formal element and or a design principle. Next, we have describe. Here, you're gonna describe why that formal element or design principle that you identified in the previous step, why these are significant. So you're gonna to wanna to think about the information that you learned in your lectures and your readings. How does this particular forma element or design principle typically make the viewer feel? What concepts does this formal element or design principle typically communicate? And then finally, we have interpret. And there's two parts here, a micro and a macro interpretation, if you will. So the micro interpretation is the interpretation of that single formal element or design principle. How does the function, right, the, that which you described in the second step, how does that function create meaning in regards to the composition? So you'll do that with each of the formal elements or design principles that you're gonna work with in your formal analysis. And after you have these like mini micro meanings for each of these formal elements or design principles, you bring it all together to create this larger overarching interpretation. How do all these little mini interpretations come together to create one large meaning that you can use to interpret the work of art as a whole? So if you're watching this video because you're one of my students, to complete your assignment, whether it's your discussion and board or your research paper, you're going to need to consult your lectures on formal elements and design principles. You're going to want to consult your lecture notes on conducting a formal analysis. And it would probably be helpful to consult your Getty reading as well. And I am putting the link for the Getty site in the description below of this video. Now, let's talk about formal analysis. Let's get started here. So this is a detail of a lovely fresco landscape painting created by the people of Fera, a Cycladic island culture that was part of the ancient Aegean, the states to late Minoan I. One notable compositional feature is the use of space. If you look at this um, painting here, you can see that there appears to be much more open space. We call this the negative space, rather than the positive space, that which the subject of the painting occupies. So this is all negative in here, this like blank background. This would constitute positive space. This is positive, positive, that's positive. So there's a lot more negative space than positive space, okay? So that was step one identify. Now, space, this can affect the viewer's perception of the subject. So in this case, it makes the composition feel open and airy. That's the described part, right? Now I'm saying the significance of this uh, formal element space. And then the interpret part is that it really reflects this idea of the natural world is being vast and open. Okay, so one, two, and three. Identify, describe, interpret. Let's look at another formal element, diagonal lines. These we can see found in the angling of the plants here. You can also see diagonal lines in the angling of the bird's wings in the position of the bird's bodies. So there's quite a few diagonal lines here. 
So diagonal lines identify, first step. Okay, second step, describe. So diagonal lines, they tend to suggest tension, but they can also be dynamic because they are lines that move in two different directions at the same time. Okay, that's my describe step. So the third step, the interpretation. These diagonal lines with their sense of dynamic movement, implied movement, instills within the painting a sense of energy. Let's talk about color. Color is also an interesting formal element to pay attention to here. You can see that there is the use of reds and oranges, both of which, as you know, are warm colors. Warm colors jump out at the viewer, but they also, as their name suggests, provide a sense of warmth. I think that such a feeling is appropriate with a landscape image where the warmth contributes to the sense of energy and vitality, and it makes the viewer imagine that this landscape is pleasurable to occupy. Now let's look at another example. Um, let's talk about repetition. So repetition, you have the repeating forms of the flowers. They repeat all throughout the composition. <clears throat> Now, according to the Getty reading, repetition creates a pattern that gives the composition the feeling of being active. And this is a nice complement to the dynamic diagonal lines that I just discussed. Repetition closely relates to the design principle unity. Also, according to the Getty reading, unity establishes a sense of harmony. So it works well to communicate this idea of nature and harmony. So you can see with my Formal analysis here. Each of the points that I discussed, the space, the diagonal line, the color, the repetition, the unity, each of those points I included an interpretation, a suggested meaning, my micro interpretations. Now I'm going to bring it all together to create one larger meaning that this composition in its entirety communicates. The use of space in the diagonal line suggest a landscape that sits within a spacious natural setting. And it is a space that is alive and teeming with life and vitality. This notion of an active, living, natural space is further reinforced by the repetition, the sense of unity in the warm color scheme. I am loving this. Now let's keep looking at this from another direction, and that would be from the direction of iconography. Symbols. So iconography doesn't have these steps laid out for us. We don't have this like neat little road map that we kind of cruise down as we are looking at a work of art. Um, so I'll give you some strategies how to approach the symbols. So what I would do first is I would just spend some time looking at the work of art to just see what images could potentially function as symbols. Just make a list. That's it. So I'm going to sit down, okay, I'm making my list, and let's see what I see here. Okay, birds, I'm going to write that down. Flowers, these look like rocks. And remember that you can also talk about color symbolically. So what colors do we see? We've got red, we've got white, we've got some blue, we've got orange. Okay, so that's a good enough list. So the next step is to look up the symbolism. Okay, remember, and I seriously cannot say this enough, you cannot make up your own symbolism. And you definitely cannot assume that this symbol has a similar meaning to what we understand in our present day culture. This was made in the 17th century BCE. Very different time, very different culture than 2021 America. So symbols they're a part of a long art historical tradition, and it's a tradition that's developed over time. So you need to keep that tradition in mind when you're doing an iconographical analysis. Now, of course, you're probably new to the study of art. You don't know these traditions off the top of your head. There's a little thing called research, but I have two really great sources that throughout the course of this semester, you can consult as you conduct iconographic analysis. So one of them is the Online Symbolism Dictionary, which you definitely have links to, as well as the Symbolism Dictionary. And I'm also putting links in the description section below. Use these sources. 
and make sure that anytime you use these sources, whether it's a discussion board or a research paper, you are citing them in your writing. Okay, let's return to my list. So as we go through this, we're going to see that there are usually a few symbolic meanings that are going to be associated with a single symbol. The trick here is to think critically about what makes sense alongside the rest of the visual information or what makes sense when considering the context. So birds, let's talk about birds. So birds are generally, I looked this up according to the online symbolism dictionary, birds are generally considered a positive symbol, perhaps even a symbol of the soul. They relate to the concept of flight and the desire to be up in the heavens close to the gods. Now I'm saying gods here rather than God, capital G, G-O-D, because this is a pre-Christian society. So that idea of God isn't going to relate to what they're trying to communicate here. So keep that in mind when you come across Christian symbolism, when you're analyzing artwork. Would this be a society that was be that would be aware of Christianity and aware of that symbolism? Birds also have, through their ability to fly, their um, they can represent transcendence. The flower. So the flower is a universal symbol of young life, according to the online symbolism dictionary. They can also represent lust or the springtime, um, and that's because that's typically when flowers bloom. And I think this reference to springtime is interesting because that typically refers to this concept of rebirth. This is when the gray of winter ends and trees, their leaves return and flowers bloom anew. We also have, um, again, color, red, and that can, according to Online Symbolism Dictionary, relate to passion, to lust, to sexual arousal. White can refer to innocence or purification. And orange can be a symbol of fertility. So there's a lot of symbolism going on here. Let's see if we can bring it all together. I'm getting a sex vibe here with the symbolism. With the symbolism of red, of orange, of flowers. And this goes well with the symbolism described in the Dictionary of Symbols as it relates to birds. According to this source, birds are a representation of yearning lovers. And I don't think this is like too off the mark when you look at these birds that seem to be like flirtatiously kissing one another. Now, in reality, they're not doing this. Birds, these particularly are swallows. Birds um, do not exhibit the courtship behavior of kissing. What's actually happening is um, they're feeding midair. But I think that it's not a coincidence that they look like they're kissing. And that would be something that a human audience might see. And humans is the audience for which this painting is directed. So the formal analysis that I conducted earlier in this video determined that this was a scene of life and vitality within the natural world. When we think about life, we think about fertility, that which creates the abundance of living things. Keep in mind, what allows for fertility to be possible? sexy time. Now, that at least is for humans, which again is the audience to which this painting is directed. So this concludes our sample formal and iconographic analysis. I hope that you not only found this to be informative and helpful, but that it also helped to instill an appreciation for the wonderful paintings that were created by Aegean artists.